Michal, you've always been a poet who's not only concerned with formal artistry and disciplined poetics, uh, but also with the commitment that poetry is a public conversation that serves the common good. Uh, you write in your introduction of the five quintets that poets have a part to play in shaping our public discourse. You know, I think of, you know, poets everywhere of all time, but I think of American poets here, uh, people from Walt Whitman to Langston Hughes to Gwendolyn Brooks or Robinson Jeffers. I think of uh, Leslie Marmon Silko and Audrey Ann Rich. I think of one of my favorite poets, Denise Levertov, who was very public about her politics. And maybe we can come back to that later. There's a long Irish tradition as well of this, this type of engagement. Um, and I just reviewed a book by your, your fellow countryman, John F. Dean. And he has a poem called uh, The Widow. And Dean is lamenting in Ireland that seems to have sold its soul to a greedy figure dressed in, quote, a pink tie and golfer's cufflinks, uh, who tells, quote, gorgeous lies in Ireland that melted down with the rest of us in the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, the speaker in that poem confronts this figure asking him, quote, that on your watch, the people's bones lie bleaching in the sun. And in the spirit of Isaiah, almost, as a prophet, uh, the, the poet, the speaker admonishes this taking uh, figure, because you are ashamed of God, because you have been paid in cash and you will thrive a while, for yet a very little while, the speaker rises to a conclusion, the tenderness of Christ is fraud. So reading, especially part two, dealing in your five quintets, I was really kind of moved by the kind of providence in a way of, of reading this and feeling something to do with economic structures and theories and how you engage, uh, you have a whole quintet uh, devoted to thinking about economics. So how do you think about this public discourse and a public discourse that comments on economic systems, justice, the poor, uh, capitalism? How do you think about it? I know we've, uh, we have a couple texts we could read, but how do you just come at it? Well, I, I mean, I think to place it in a context, yeah. uh, the, four, the five quintets is in fact an attempt to look at, at modernity over the last 400 years and an attempt to try to understand through the movers and shakers of these 400 years what has happened and what might be the vision for the future. And I wanted to take the whole of society and it seems to me that by taking the arts, by taking economics, politics, by taking science and of course theology, Stoke philosophy, it covers the breadth uh, largely of what makes up our society and the fabric of our society. So economics for me is a very important part of that. And that plays of course into the whole question of the ecology, which is a burning issue for us, literally a burning issue. Uh, and um, so I think behind that economics and politics play very much into that. So we have to take a look at the whole fabric of society. Um, now, if you're talking about the function of poetry in the public discourse, let me just give you an example actually from science, if I may, because it seems to me a fascinating one. When you think about it, the um, science which brought us in physics, New Newtonian physics, brought us into the whole business of the Enlightenment and measurement and metrics and so forth, which many of us still think in, and for everyday practical use that is so, but it's almost a hundred years, or around a hundred years, since we discovered, of course, that the subatomic sub world, uh, and right down to, to quarks, right down to, to the hadrons and so on, the whole of, of the world is, is in motion. But that hasn't seeped through yet to mm. the public consciousness. People still think in the Enlightenment mode, they still think in the Newtonian Enlightenment, uh, almost logical positive fashion. Mm. Now it seems to me that poetry can have, can have a huge function here in l allowing what we know about the world now scientifically to percolate down into the consciousness, into the social consciousness, into the culture, so people think differently. Mm. That's interesting, because you think, I just was thinking about language there, because you know, language can be, can be fixed in, in some certain declarative way, but really it knows something else too. It's organic and it's very, it has a, a, a life underneath its, fix, its, its rigidness. And I think there's something about a scientific an analogy there that, that might bear out in some way. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. The, the extraordinary thing about language yeah. is that it is so, uh, it, it is so um, 
regular yeah. under the surface, you know. Uh, in other words, there are rules and there are things changing the whole time, yeah. which even a native speaker of the language isn't conscious of, but it's always rearranging itself. Uh, the creativity is there and the fixity is there, to, so to speak, it's in, and their intention. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think of a word, say, like the word status. Mm -hmm. Do you say status or do you say status? Right. We're in a process moving from the, from the Latin status to the, uh, the diphthong, the standard mm -hmm. diphthong of English status. But nobody who's an Asian speaker of English thinks about that, it's just happening. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, you, you don't talk about uh, ratio, you talk about ratio, it's already happened in these words. So all these things are happening subconsciously almost, yeah. uh, uh, and yet um, the, the people for whom it's the first language are, are not aware of it. So, right. so you do have this substructure, that this, this, it's always structuring itself. And even children, when they're learning, have a structure. Uh, they, they, even the tiniest children, when they're speaking, they have a grammar of a sort. Yeah. Well, let's stick with that. Then we can maybe come back for a reading to give an example. But I do, because when I think about the art of your poetry, you do, you know, not every poet works in metered poetry anymore or kind of uh, fixed forms. And you do that. And so we think about, again, you know, what's the, uh, the, the relationship between form and content, between sound and sense. You know, the five quintets pays a deep, it's, it's innovative but it pays a deep respect to kind of a formalism. So that maybe we had a text to read about this dealing section. Maybe, maybe you can read that first bit and then we can kind of think about how form is uh, conveying or uh, content or something along those lines. Absolutely. Draw it out further. A absolutely. Uh, well, let, let me start with just a, a brief quotation uh, from uh, the section about the quintet about um, economics, which I call dealing. Yeah. I, I use a present participle for them all, as you've noticed. Mm -hmm. Making is the art, and uh, yeah. economics is dealing, steering is politics. Even the five seem to be really yes. music, musically connected as well. Well, they are, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, um, but let me, so I'll just read this, th 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 this piece. Free flow finance gives quick fix gains, but blows up bubbles that must burst. Dot com will concentrate our cash in risk-free zones, increase the rift, between the poor, our puff one currency that soon must crash. A sudden rush, then panic sell. In gaps between, we gain and choose when best to bet, trade in and out. A worldwide gain of win or lose. So, it, it hit, you know, it hits the here, the here of the word. Uh, with the rhythm, the rhythm really is. It, it, it means everything to this. Uh, conveying the truth of this. Yeah, yes, I mean, it's, it's um, you're, t you're talking about, the, the, in, a, in many ways, the, the greater question of form and content. Right. Uh, and that has always fascinated me. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a big tradition, particularly here in the US, there's a big tradition of free verse and people, there's a kind of a myth about that, uh, it, it, that anything that has form lacks spontaneity. Uh, and that was very much in the American culture. Spontaneity was everything. Mm. Um, see, I don't quite see it like that. I take the view of the ancient Greeks, which was the perfect marriage between form and content. Mm. After all, you know, you could, you could just go out and let us scream, and that would be tremendously spontaneous, but it wouldn't be art. Mm. Uh, um, there's, so that you have to face the fact that this is art, in other words, mm. uh, and so it does have form as well as content. Mm. Now, the odd thing about it is that sometimes now you have new formalists who come along and they're so busy wanting to shock you with the, with the rhyme yeah. that it actually, it actually, you react against it. Yeah. Just as people reacted against the sing-song rhyme. Uh -huh. I mean, the, the free verse was a reaction against that. Yeah. And now the new formalis formalism sometimes comes with these almost outrageous rhymes on purpose yeah. to kind of to shock you. And that gets tedious after a while too. Yeah. So it seems to me the perfect mixture is when you get the form and yeah. the content on a, coming together unobtrusively. Yeah. So that yeah. I, I, I used to occasionally, when I read to a class uh, um, in a school, when I used to visit, I haven't done it for many years, but I would read them a sonnet and I would say to them, did you notice anything about that? And they'd say, no, I didn't do it. And then I would say, it's actually a sonnet, and I would show it how it was a sonnet, but they were very surprised yeah. uh, because the thing had met so, had come together so well that the content had yeah. borne them along and yeah. they hadn't noticed it was a sonnet. If you notice too clearly it's a sonnet, then the form yeah. has got on top of the content. Yeah. I like to think that an uncluttered person, and it's hard to be uncluttered in this, that 
it, it just, you, re, you receive it differently. And maybe it's just almost so subtle that, that what, this is what good art can do. Uh, once you, you know, with the kids, it was very subtle. They didn't realize it was, a, it was a structured affair. But there's something in their uncluttered lives that adhere to their, you know, to their understanding. That, you know what I mean? Uh, oh, I do. Yeah. I do. And I mean, I've got to say, too, I mean, I, I have written poems with, uh, without, with, sure. uh, earlier on, I yeah. particularly, but I, I've got more, I think, as time went on, I, I wanted more structure. See, I, I don't want to eschew the fun of it. Yeah. I mean, I remember skipping as a child, yeah. and it was quite extraordinary, the rhythms of, you know, wibbledy wobbledy wibbledy wobbledy <laughs> jelly on the plate, jelly on the plate. I just loved it. Yeah. So yeah. Why, why should I eschew that? The, yeah. The, yeah. There's a magic to it when yeah. words rhyme, when words have rhythms and so on. It, it, it just it moves you. Yeah. See, I think of, in a way of poetry as being somewhere on the spectrum between music and, and good prose. Yeah. Good prose has rhythms, and obviously music has a, has various pitches which which you don't. But poetry gets gets the with, with its rhyme and its sound and its sense gets nearer music than than than, than prose. So you're halfway between. Yeah. Uh, um, you still have to use your mind in a way that you, in, mu in music it sort of seeps in through the pulses, yeah. but it seeps also in a little bit through the pulses with, with meter and with, 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 with rhyme and rhythm and so forth. Right? You know, it's interesting because I, I teach poetry here at Loyola, uh, undergraduate and graduate, um, and the undergraduates still say, okay, here comes poetry, do you like poetry? No, but like... They love poetry, right? I mean, because it's so close to a kind of a musicality. Um, but let me push a little bit further on this form and content uh, dynamic. Um, you know, the old saying is that discipline will set you free uh, as an artist. So there's yes, something yes. like that. But then you, your muse, and this has been your muse for a long time, Madam Jazz, right? Now, jazz, uh, to some maybe unenlightened, I suppose, not to be elitist, ear may seem like it has no form to it. Ooh, that would be a mistake. A, a huge mistake. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're actually onto there. And I do yeah. believe in, in some ways that yeah. discipline, uh, discipline is a form of freedom. Yeah. And, and um, in things that were the most emotional times for me when I wrote the previous book to this, One Crimson Thread, which covered the final years of my first, my late wife's uh, uh, death and my mourning, I reached, I reached for the sonnet because it could contain the emotion. Mm. Otherwise, you, you'd float, out, I mean, the, the emotion would take you over. So there is a huge mm. thing about that discipline, you know, mm. uh, um, which actually, and the interplay of dis discipline helps to form the content, mm. and the content helps to form the, 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 uh, the discipline. So mm. the, 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 the form and content both influence one another in a quite mm. an extraordinary way. And in jazz, this is, as you say, the, the great thing is, I remember talking to a saxophonist one time, a mm. friend of mine, and, and uh, he said, when you take off in a riff, you know exactly where you're going. And if the people are good that are with you playing, they know exactly when it's coming back and they know, what, they know what's going on. It's, it's, it's this wonderful mix like life between the ordinary, because often in jazz you take the ordinary tune, mm. but then, my gosh, what, what are the wonderful riffs? What are the wonderful ways you can take off from this, which are different, which are new, which are fresh, mm. and yet the underlying is the ordinary. It's like our lives. Our, our lives are ordinary. We're born and we die. But, but look what you can do in between. Right. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. I was just thinking as you were speaking about, you know, finding some anchorage in form in the sonnet um, with your late wife's Parkinson's disease and her, and her subsequent death, and may God rest her. Um, I was talking to a Jesuit once, Jack Isaac, God rest him. Uh, he was speaking about the church. And he said, can you imagine not having the church as you stood before God? And I thought... Yeah, I can't imagine that. But I think what he was trying to say was the sacramentality of and liturgy was a way to, to for humans. It wasn't God; it was us. You know that we it helped us to face God. Some kind of structure that way. Absolutely. Yeah. No. No. I mean, I <laughs> I have occasionally attended uh, um, humanist funerals, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, you long for liturgy. <laughs> You absolutely long for liturgy. Yeah. And I think everybody who even wasn't, isn't a believer would long for liturgy yes. because we need these forms to, yeah. to, to, to deal with life. To, to, yeah. to, so you're right. I think, yeah. I, th I think it's the humans that need it more than, more than any god yeah. needs it. Yeah. yeah. Let's think a bit more along these theological lines uh, and content and ideas. And we turn a bit to theology and philosophy. You know, as an Irishman, you've seen collisions of religion uh, turn to violence in your life, uh, not only culturally and, and aesthetically, but politically. Do you think 
that Protestant and Catholic theological imaginations shape or have shaped late modern political life differently? Can these... Yeah. It's, very, it's, a very, it's a very difficult one. It's yeah. a, very, a very, very tricky one. I, I've often thought about this. Uh, I mean, I think, what, I think whatever about shaping the imagination, I think they do, it does have an effect on society. Because, and this is very broad terms, but as I see what happened in the Reformation was that you had had in Catholicism an overemphasis of, of the sacramental. Mm. And somewhat a, a, a neglect of the word. Mm. I mean, that was even true in my upbringing. I mean, you know, you were parsed out parts of the Bible in, serv- in, in mass and in other liturgies, but you weren't encouraged to read it. I mean, I know post-Vatican too, that, yeah. that, that, that came in. Catholics don't know the Bible famously. No, yeah. no, yeah. of course, yeah. not at all. I mean, yeah. as a growing up, I wouldn't have known there was 150 Psalms. How would I have known? I never read them that way when I was, when I was a boy. I, I, the Psalms I love, I mean, I think they're extraordinary, but you didn't. So what I'm coming around to is that, that I, it's, it, it's heartbreaking to think that the correction that took place towards the word, if that had only happened within Catholicism, mm. look what we'd have been spared. Right. You know, look, at, look at the Thirty Years' War, look, which is still being echoed in Northern Ireland this is, you know, as we speak. Yeah. Uh, um, what would have been spared if that, if that shift towards the word, back towards to get an ecology between the word and sacrament had happened within, mm. within Catholicism, but it didn't, and history is history. But it seems to me that if you look at societies where... Um, Catholicism fades and begin and secularization takes over. I think the effect is different, say, than when you have Lutheranism. And I'm thinking I lived in Norway, I was at university in, in Oslo. And though most most of my friends wouldn't have at the time believed in anything particular, but they'd have had a Lutheran background, they'd have had an emphasis on the word. And it seems to me that left them with a civic consciousness yeah. with a feeling of duty towards other people and so on because mm. they the word was important to them right. uh, whereas where you have catholicism fading or where, where, where it goes it leaves more chaos it seems to me because it doesn't leave that legacy in the same way of civil consciousness and civil con, uh, civil conscious in the uh, 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 now i may be wrong but i've yeah. always felt that, that 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 because when the sacrament breaks down what have you yeah well, I don't know. I, I, yes. I think there's a lot there. I think even the, you can find an, an analogy in uh, American history that was largely founded by Protestants. There is, there was a, a civic responsibility that was way more kind of um, constituent and, and baked in. Yes, that is almost diminishing now. But then Catholic social teaching is also very popular in this country, and that really does, um, you know, uh, that really is a more a more articulate, I think, um, theory of the common good, our lives together. That does kind of reduce to a civic responsibility. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, um, and it should. Yes, but 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 in my experience, yeah. that, that the the you know, uh, um, it, it's when sacrament breaks down. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, there's there, there's more. It's it's more chaotic somehow or other. That, you know, and I see yes. that. Uh, that yes. That's that's something for me to to think about further. Now, let's bring someone like Charles Taylor into the conversation, uh, who I know you read and and figures into your work. Now, let's pick up on secularism. What what is gained? What is lost in this in this current moment? Uh, what has replaced these structures of religion, if anything at all? Well, I mean, that, if I can return to the five quintets, sure. I mean, in each of them, I have tried to come towards a vision of what the future might be, uh, and um, you know, we spoke earlier of economics, and my my vision is one where absolutely where where all human resources are brought together in the hope of with generosity and justice in the hope of allowing the great, allowing people to, to achieve their potentiality. And I stress potentiality because that's the, that's the Amartya Sen view of it, yes. not simply you know, counting out the economics or the metrics of a given country. Yeah. Uh, and the same in the, in, in the politics, I, I, I take this vision of wanting to start from where we are, pragmatically from where we are, never a tabula rasa, never, and really moving pragmatically, trying to help society flourish, but being prepared in humility, patience, and fortitude to realize you're only going to make the world a little less imperfect than it is. Yes. Uh, there, there are no perfections, and yet we strive. To, we, we must strive. Yeah. And then back to your question about the theology and the philosophy, this one fascinates me because I, I, um, 
I have read Charles Taylor. Uh, I, in fact, it, it was very influential when I began on the five quintets because he covers this 400 uh, years. Uh, and his basic premises is that you start in a society where God is taken for granted and you finish in a society, the Atlantic cultures he calls it, though I think you could throw in Japan as well, but, but, but where, where, where the, in, in academe at least, and, uh, um, the default position is agnostic, if not, if not atheist. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, but I wanted to do this with the movers and shakers, with people, with personalities, and so forth. And so, where do where 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 is this all leading? I think it's leading to the vision in this one is leading to the idea that look, it's we are now, we are still human beings, and human beings are seekers of meaning. There is no doubt about that. We we are we we, we seek meaning, but we but we're now in a multicultural society, a multiracial society. We can never again isolate ourselves, so we have to learn to live with the quality of difference and tolerance, mm. which doesn't mean not the deepening of one's own faith, uh, but allowing, allowing conversation and collaboration mm. with, 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 with people of different views and different faiths. Mm. Uh, but I think that has to be faced. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and, and it's no bad thing, because I, I often think of Solzhenitsyn's um, Nobel Prize uh, speech when he talked about having, having a jewel with, with the sun sparkling it out in different directions. Yes. We have a monopoly on truth. We have, it sparkles out in different directions. Our direction is the, the one, you know, um, in which, which I have been reared, in which I, which, yeah. which I see it through. But I must always allow for the fact that I don't have that monopoly. Yeah. Others have, the, have, have yeah. the sparkle, and we don't own God. Yeah, we don't. I think that's beautiful, and I think I see that in, in five quintets. It's, it, it opens and opens, even though it's, it, it, it accounts for history. And you, you mentioned a couple of things. There. It's pragmatic, but it accounts for history. It looks at Greek virtues you just mentioned that are, that are as useful today. and they're, The society is different, but those virtues are... Absolutely. But that there's, you know, the Solzhenitsyn is, is a perfect example. It's almost the Jesuits always say around here, um, you know, they're, they are moving out into culture to be with people, to accompany people. And they're always asking, what is God doing over there, right? We don't harness and shackle God. God, we will never get there. And God, and if we're open, if we open up, that's who God is. So absolutely. That, and it, I mean, if I to return again yeah, to this, yeah. the, in the science, which I didn't mention, mention yeah. that, that that seems to me. I, I mentioned earlier, of yeah. course, that we know we now know that this that everything is is dancing, yeah. and that there is no view from nowhere. And that's, I think, the important the, the the important thing for us yeah. is, is that. We, once Heisenberg came, and once we realized that we can't observe without affecting our environment, yeah. we are part of we are, we are part of it all. Right. Uh, uh, and so it seems to me the vision must be uh, to keep on exploring, always trying to find more, but in the knowledge that we are part of it, in the knowledge that we can never have an overview, yeah. we can never be outside of it. Yes, uh, 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 yeah. and so we can we must we must we must be part of the wonder as we discover in humility to know that there'll probably be mysteries that will always, always elude us. Right. Now, I, I could, uh, Taylor's observation that faith has become one discourse or one life among many, he's, you know, he's right, that's how people view it. But I don't think that replaces the reality of what you're, I mean, it doesn't. No, no, I, 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 I admired that book very much, yeah. but I, and I, I don't want to be too hard, but yeah. I, feel, I feel that the vision at the end peters out a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, uh, but but I'm a huge admirer of the book yeah. and of Sources of Self, which was another yeah. great inspiring book. Yeah, uh, with, yes. Well, if you wouldn't mind, let's we can maybe make a transition because we're talking about choreography and dancing and the figures in your work prominently. So if you wouldn't mind reading the uh, the section which we spoke about before, and then I'll I'll follow up with a question. The real balance then is raised, which means consumption grows, and such a rising tide will hoist anew the whole economy to even greater heights. And so we see there never is a need to intervene. Instead, we let the system stabilize itself and sanction markets own machine. All right in theory, at least. But only time would tell how long stagnation needs to last before the prices fall enough to prime consumers' trust as some will wait until they tumble even more. Or what about each deepening debt and those whose business may go bust? So much more harrowing and hurt before regimes can readjust. 
Your schemes to mend communities reign in the individual. Your lavish browning breath of view remains the legacy you leave. There is no good of life but love, as in our globe you glimpse anew one interjoined ecology that's loose and yet it's so precise, a fitting choreography, prefigured dance of paradise. Yeah. That's, of course, about Marshall, uh, who was highly influenced by Browning, yeah. the poet, which, who also figures in the making, uh, in the section on the arts, yeah. in the quintet about the arts, yeah. because Browning was a very public poet. Right, and that's a, a great point to make. I think what moved me in, this, in these last lines, because uh, you, know, you are meditating on uh, economics, business, uh, abuses, successes, but that, that we are reminded here that these systems, they mean nothing unless they are focused on humans. And, if, and, what's, and what, is the, what is the virtue of humans, or what's the, the highest place that we can reach? It's love. Of course, it, it, that, and, and that, that, that is what must steer, to, in my vision, of where economics has to go. It, right. it, steers, it steers the whole thought of, of, as I said, harnessing all our resources right. so that people can achieve their potential. But we must do it with justice and generosity, not just justice, yeah. but the combination of justice and generosity, yeah. which, of course, points towards love. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and then... Again, uh, the the choreography that figures so prominently in your work, it, it just makes me think, uh, as we move toward kind of the final part of the interview, is, you know, the last, and, you know, this this took you 10 years to write. It did, it's a major indeed, part yes, of your life. Yes, and um, yes. and I, I've been reading it off and on for a couple of months. And I may be halfway through, but then I kind of jumped forward, which I don't I didn't want to do. But when I, I wanted to read the meaning uh, quintet. And when I came across figures in that quintet, I was so very moved. And I thought of all the theology that I studied. So you mentioned everybody uh, in Canto Four, for example, you have Hegel, Kierkegaard, Barth, Levinas, Arendt, and then a person I worked on is Hans Urs von Balthasar. Oh, yes. I just yes. was, I just jumped for joy. Yes, the Saturday people. The Saturday people. Yes, <laughs> yes. Holy Saturday. But you know, yes. also the, um, who he worked on, he was a great debt to Maximus Confessor, whose theology of perichoresis. Yes. is very, very important. I think could you, is, there's a, just the dance, the divine dance. Yeah, yes, it, 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 it's, it's, I mean, it's a wonderful concept, and it right. runs, as you said, right through the five quintets, yeah. because when you think, when you think about it, I, I, I will, I, I'll read the epigraph when we come to, to the end of our interview, because yeah. it prefigures, it, it uh, adumbrates uh, uh, the, the message, if you like, or the vision, I prefer to call it, or the angle of vision in each of the quintets. Uh, um, Van Balthasar, yeah. or Balthasar, as I should say, yeah. uh, you know, he he he, um, he 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 was an extraordinary figure for me too, you know, and, and also his relationship with this was it Spire was the name of the yeah, Adrian von Spire, uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely extraordinary that inspiration, and I mean there was nothing untoward about it. Uh, 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 Bart, on the other hand lived with his mistress, and uh, his secretary, and his wife in the one house. So, I mean, it, it yeah. begs all sorts of questions. I'm one of yeah. the greatest theologians of the last century, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so, 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 but, but it is very interesting that both but women were the, were the muses in yes. some ways for, 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 for both of these uh, yes. uh, uh, extraordinary and almost parallel figures, in a way, Balthasar being the Catholic one. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, they were so, close friends, yes. Bart and Balthazar. That's right. Uh, Balthazar That's right. respected Bart quite deeply. Yes. I think he called him a better theologian half the time. Yeah, and it wasn't, wasn't Bart asked to the Vatican as well? He yeah. was the first to be asked to yeah. the Vatican. No, it, they were, it was an extraordinary, they're an extraordinary pairing. Yeah. yeah. It's quite a time, too. You know, there's robust public theology in those days, and I don't know if we have that today so much, uh, and for a lot of reasons. But um, let me, do you, do you think of yourself as a Catholic poet? How does that? Yeah. The answer, I think, to that is no. Yeah. I see myself as a poet who is a Catholic. Yeah. Um, that is to say, I'm a Catholic and do my best. I am somewhat a la carte, uh, 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 but uh, I, I, that's my tradition. That's, as the Buddha said, grow where you're planted. And so I do my, <laughs> I do my best to grow where I'm planted. Yeah. Uh, for all my differences about certain things and so forth, I do my best to do it. And that obviously informs my work. Yeah, I think of Flannery O'Connor there, who said very similar things about being a writer. Uh, you know, you wouldn't, you know, how would, it's almost a, a way you understand being, right? And a, and a way you understand art. You know, you, you, the art is the thing, the, the vision is the thing. 
um, and the vision is true to any type of theology, it just, it's almost a, a silent reality. You know, yeah, well, I mean, Patrick Kavner, uh, who, who for me is, was the greatest poet, uh, at his best, was the greatest yeah. Irish poet of the 20th century, uh, he, he said any poet was a theologian. Yes. And uh, after all, both, in my, to my view, as, as I see poetry, both are secrets of meaning yes. and beauty. Yeah. I love that. I always love that about Patrick Kavanaugh quite a lot. I, I think even scientists are theologians. A lot of them don't want to say they are, but I think that in many ways that they're oh, doing I, I, that absolutely. Kind of absolutely. Yeah. It sometimes frightens me the number, of, uh, not not all by yeah. any means, but the number of scientists uh, who don't see the poetry and don't see the theology of what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. Uh, their, their 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 vision is too narrow. Yeah. I hope from what I've done in the five quintets in this yeah. section called Finding About yeah. Science, I have interspersed yeah. between all the wonders as the, as they as they are being discovered. Yeah. I've interspersed quotations from the Psalms and from the Quran. It's excellent. I need to read that section. And I'm thinking right now, just practically and pedagogically, to get that section into some... We have a, a, a textbook here out of Loyola called Healing Earth that brings spirituality to environmental science. Maybe, you know, it's an e-book. I wonder if there's a way to, like, put in that chapter because it's bereft of poetics, that book is. Yeah, and yes. we, need, we need poetry. Yeah, no, it's, it, for, for me, that was the extraordinary thing. Yeah. I've never seen the contradiction, you know, when, when the, the Psalms are even the... The Quran, which, as I said, I quote as well, mm -hmm. expressed this extraordinary wonder at creation. Yes. You know, each time, each time you've gone to, into the subatomic world, yeah. or when you've gone up into the black holes, yeah. up into the universe, this 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 galaxy in which we're out on the edge and a tiny little spot. I mean, the wonder of that. Yeah. Uh, I see no contradiction. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I don't either. Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, not dancing around this, but we need to make a connection to to Dante. You think about theology and poetry, but even science and politics, that, that view Dante had, not maybe not as developed in the science, but the, that kind of wide-ranging uh, interdisciplinary view Dante modeled for us. How do you think about your connection with the five quintets well, to... Well, well, Dante is my model, yeah. uh, uh, because at the end of the Middle Ages, he summed up the Middle Ages and somehow prepared, on the cusp of modernity, prepared us for modernity. Yeah. My hope, and this may be hubris, but my hope is when modernity seems to be passing, whatever we call it, to post-modernity, late modernity, chase of modernity, but there's been a paradigm shift, yeah. to use the yeah. scientific Tom, yeah. Thomas uh, Cluen term, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, there is a par the certainties have fallen that we were used to. Yeah. So I wanted to try and sum that up, but yeah. also point towards where we might be headed, what, what values we need to take with us and to, to retrieve and to, to, to nurture. Yeah. You know, we're doing a 50-year look back at the year 1968 and comparing it to 2018. And I think most people will say that we are living in a convulsive time that might be the biggest sea change since Gutenberg's printing press in 1438. Yes, which, marks, which, mark, which marks the beginning yeah. of modernity. Exactly. Yes. So you went to, you were a student in 68, right? I was. And how do you think about those 50 years does, are things kind of exponentially spinning here? I just, I, we have the digital revolution. We have you know Taylor and exclusive humanism in 1968. All these shifts, Thomas Kuhn's models of paradigm shifts, yes. all these things are happening in this 50 years. So you wake up one morning and you feel like there's no ground there anymore. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I did do a book called Globe, yeah. which, which f focused on that theme. You know, would we be remembered for anything? You know, or, or do we leave any footprints at all? The whole thing is so, is, is so mobile in many ways. Yeah. Uh, um, so it's been an extraordinary 50 years to live through. Uh, um, the, but, and I think it's living through that, those 50 years, the, the break we made in the 60s, and I was part of that break. Mm -hmm. You know, we were the 68 generation, we were the student revolutions. We were going to mend the world. We, I, I had the answer to everything when I was in 1968. <laughs> I, I, I knew everything. Uh, and suddenly, you know, the next generation came along and saw, in some ways, the flower power people as foolish. They weren't political. They hadn't the fortitude and patience of politics. Right. They just wanted everything immediately. Uh, and a disillusion came in. A whole individualistic, a gopher generation came. And I lived through all of that, and the, uh, both the, the, the uh, elation and the disillusionment afterwards mm -hmm. about it, which I think forced me ultimately to think as to where we were in the bigger picture of things mm -hmm. as, as we move towards, I think, the end of what would be seen as modernity. Yeah, you're correct. What, what would you cite as disillusioning? What, what did you wake up to? I woke up to the disillusionment that, that economics 
had so much to do with it because we in the 60s on, on a bubble you know there was a, there was a great particularly in Ireland where the where the economy took off we industrialized and so forth and all students talked about politics we talked about philosophy I mean we rebelled against our backgrounds in many ways many both class and religion and then existentialism was all the rage Beckett's waiting for Godot all of that was in the air and, and suddenly then a generation came after us who only thought about where were they going to get a job and make mm. a career mm. because the, the economy had changed and it was very shocking to see that in many ways you know mm. so that influences me too in making sure there's a quintet about 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 the economy because it it, it is a huge part of the fabric of society yeah, alongside yeah. the arts and sciences and yeah. the theology, philosophy, and politics. Right, that's that's in, that's an essential point to make. That really does make a lot of sense. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, we'll just a couple a little lightning round of not too personal questions, and then we can conclude with a little reading from the five quintets, if you wouldn't mind. I'd be delighted. Okay. To hear that. Um, Dublin versus New York City. Well, <laughs> I moved to New York City at sixty-seven, ah. uh, uh, and uh, it, I mean, it's I had I went first there in seventy-one. I wouldn't have found my way around a corner. I was got in taxis to wherever I was reading and so <laughs> forth. Uh, it was an extraordinary move, one I had never expected. Uh, if you told me a year a year earlier I'd be living in Manhattan, I wouldn't have believed you. Oh. But love does that to you. Yeah, uh, and uh, I fell in love with the New Yorker. She's a top surgeon in New York, and uh, I could work in New York. She, her career was in New York, so I, I came. Yeah. Uh, it's been very exciting. It's been a wonderful four and a half years. And, you know, New York for me is, a, in a, if there was more generosity, if that 1% didn't hold 99%, yeah. at, uh, I'm talking Paul Krugerman, of course, The Economist, sure. if there was more generosity and justice and, and gentleness, New York is a prevision of heaven. Uh. Look at all the races, all the religions, every size, shape of human being, yeah. all walking the streets, talking all these languages, pr professing all these different faiths, yeah. uh, 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 all these different cultures. It is a prefission of, of heaven. There's heaven, as I said, but it needs more generosity yeah. and more gentleness. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, uh, and justice. And justice, yes. yes. Agreed. Okay, a book you're reading of the, our viewers may want to take a look at? Anything? Striking your fancy these days? I'm just trying to think yeah. uh, straight, straight off what, yeah. the, what the most exciting thing uh, uh, re reading is. I suppose what I'm reading most is my closest friend uh, for 50 something years <laughs> since I was in Trinity is David Ford. Oh, the theologian. Who, the theologian, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that's why I've been reading theology all my life oh, because yeah. I was his first reader and he was <laughs> my first reader. Oh. Uh, and uh, he is at the moment doing a commentary on, on John's Gospel. Oh. Uh, and so I'm reading it as it comes out. And I think that's probably one of the most fascinating things I'm reading at the moment. That's very, he's uh, uh, Lewis to your Tolkien or something like that? C.S. Lewis? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wasn't aware of that relationship. Uh, yeah, they, yes, yeah, they yes, were yes. Very, very close yes, friends I, for lots yes. of years. Um, excellent. And then, you know, these are basic, but uh, viewer, you should read this poet. Which poet would you say? Oh, Patrick Kavanagh. Yeah. I would say immediately. He is, in my mind, at his best, the greatest poet of the 20th century in Ireland and not well enough known abroad. Yeah, agreed. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, and Denise Levertov would be another name I mentioned, oh, mentioned her before. She, yeah. Though uh, there's some very beautiful poetry, very, very beautiful poetry there, you know. And, and if you want to go back, this is actually um, biographical, but when David and I became close friends first, we swapped poets. Oh. He gave me Herbert and I gave him Kavanagh. Oh. And we both made a list of our favorite poems in the books and still have those lists. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I would say, I would say Kavanagh, Herbert. Yeah, Herbert. Uh, 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 and I would also say Denise Levitoff. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I, I work on Denise Levitoff. In fact, yes. we're going to a class afterwards and Levitoff is the subject today. So one of our students is giving a seminar on Denise Levitoff. Uh, dear viewer, if you've not read Levitoff, uh, make your way with haste to her work. Okay, well, we've come to it now. We really want to congratulate you on this on this book, The Five Quintets. Uh, this is a masterwork. It took over nine years, to, close to ten years, to what? How, how do you view it? It's a. It would be fatuous to say you, it's male birth. You know, men say, "Oh, I gave birth." It's not like that. But uh, how do you view giving the book to the world? How does that feel for you? Well, it's it's uh, what I. 
you have no choice. <laughs> I remember once in Japan when I was asked a question similar to that from the audience and somebody said, why did you choose poetry? And I said, no, poetry chose yeah. me. Yeah. Chose me. And, and uh, I got that wonderful sound which comes from Japanese audiences when you say something that the surprise them, goes, they all go, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> was, well, then I will yes, as well. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> they give me half. The first verse is an invocation which is very traditional. I mean, this is a Dantean work, if you like. Milton, the same. These works tend to start with invocations. Uh, and um, the second to sixth prefigure the vision of each of the other, uh, each of the quintets. The first one being obviously the arts, meaning. Second one being dealing, which is economics. The third one, steering, which is the metaphor for politics. Uh, and the fourth one, finding, for science, and the fifth one, meaning, for theology, Stoke philosophy. So the vision is in two to six, and then I finish uh, off with uh, two further verses. Be with me, Madam Jazz, I urge you now. Riff in me so I can conjure how you breathe in us more than we dare allow. In words and hues and tones, please, Madam Blow, play in me the grace I need to know, how in your complex glory we let go. Show me how an open hand is worry-free. Spark again your love's economy, your generous first words spoken, let there be. Enhance our trust in hard-earned betterment. Humbler world we may in turn augment in long adagios of increment. While marvelling at your choreography, stars and quarks beyond our mastery, we still explore to praise your mystery. Although each sacred book's a lip-read score, improvising there is always more. You jazz, and what's our own and our rapport? Each solo and ensemble of a piece, grooves and tempos shifting without cease, we flourish in a syncopated piece. In all our imperfections we advance, trusting in creation's free-willed chance. Sweet Madam Jazz, in you, we are the dance.